coming up here and bringing their slaves. It leaves out um, how when a raft of escaping slaves came up the Mississippi River, the dock workers, most of whom were Irish, threw rocks and stones at them and made it impossible for them to land because they were afraid they'd take their jobs and they had to, yeah. they had to be towed all the way up to Fort Snelling in order to get off the boat. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give any indication that in the territorial era, the entire economy of St. Paul and Minnesota was dependent on annuity payments that the federal government paid to um, Indians who had signed treaties and um, that the merchants of St. Paul uh, profited a great deal from separating Native people from their much needed money. So there are lots of things that aren't in those murals. And so clearly it's not an accurate description of our, heritage, of our history. The things that are there are representations of part of our history, right? But that's the difference between history and heritage, that um, heritage doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to recognize the tough stuff. But heritage, and this heritage in particular, has a value looking back on it because now it has become history. Not history of the beginnings of Minnesota, but history of how people chose to see themselves, what the culture was like in 1931. So in that respect, it is history. In another respect, it's also highly regarded art. And the city hall and the county courthouse, which um, you know anybody who hasn't visited it should, and anyone who has visited, um, I think would probably agree that it's pretty much uh, 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 a working museum. It is, it is exceptionally beautiful with the art of that era. So we've got a couple things that we have to deal with here. Um, you know, this idea that this is, uh, this was intended to be heritage, but we recognize that it's not, uh, it's not the full history of this place that we all know and love. Um, but also, I, I have a couple, a, a couple of points that I want to make, and then I want to turn it over to the next person. Um, in the way that people are depicted, Native people and African Americans are depicted, um, I just want to be sure that when we're having this discussion, we don't demean people who do, did do physical labor to build, um, to build the city. Because the fact that it shows African Americans hauling loads down on, on the wharf should not be something that is looked down upon. In fact, her, I brought my visuals here. Um, Herbert Gutman, who is a, a, a renowned American historian, uh, wrote this, you know, was uh, in charge of the American Social History Project, which as social history was becoming um, kind of the new history. A two volume textbook called Who Built America? And the whole purpose of this is to recognize that the people who worked hard with their hands and built this country should be celebrated. And they're, they certainly uh, are as responsible for, for all the successes of this country as anyone who we described as great men. So there is that. Now, of course, it doesn't, um, the mural doesn't take in the full range of the way African Americans contributed to the, the growth of the city. So clearly, um, there needs to be additions to this story as well as what's there now. But what's there now was an accurate depiction of one way that African Americans contributed to the growth of the city. So when we talk about Native Americans, well, that gets a lot more complicated because, of course, we stole all their land, uh, and, and that is that is a problem. But as far as the um, the Christianity part of it goes, the idea it's, it's a little off-putting to see the 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 priest in his cassock with his cross, but we do have to 
take into account that um, many Native people had embraced Christianity many decades before Minnesota became uh, a part of, you know, became, became settled. So, um, particularly the Anishinaabe um, had, had a very early version of, of Christianity, Catholicism that was practiced, that was kind of a combination of um, Native spirituality and, and some version of Catholicism. So there's, my sense of these murals is that they're, they give us a partial story of the past, but I don't see anything in them that is, to, to me, offensive, and I look forward to hearing other people's perspective on this. But it's certainly incomplete, and what we need to do is add. That's my thoughts on it. Let's do next. Would you care to be next? Sure. Okay. That's your city. I'm pretty handy. My name is John Pupart. Um, I live in the city of West St. Paul, Dakota County. Um, I'm retired from a couple of different places from the state of Minnesota, for one, and then the uh, American Indian Policy Center, which I founded in 1990. I retired from there for a couple of years ago. Um, my education is U of M, Harvard University, and a bunch of other in-betweens. But uh, I say those things because I just wanted you to know, to reflect on what I'm about to say is probably uh, in a couple of partitions. One is from uh, mainstream America, and the other part is from the traditional American Indian worldview. And uh, I don't, frankly, know much about the murals, but I do enough, but I do know enough about history and the types of history, and I'm glad you pointed out History and heritage have a couple of different interpretations. Um, I've been around for, well, let me see, the state is 160 years old. And I've been around half of that time. So I know a couple of things about a couple of things. And uh, it, it helps me from time to time. And I remember one time, uh, what I was just going to say was, I can't speak for all Indians. I remember one of my friends said that one time uh, at a rally in Minneapolis, and he told a news reporter, he said, I can't speak for all Indians. And the reporter says, well, if you can't, who can? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a good conversation started right there. Because while I can't speak for all American Indians, I, I have a sense and an experience in my own uh, lived experience as an American Indian. And uh, the way that I generate information and opinions is by going out and talking with members of my community, wherever they might be, whether it's statewide or to St. Paul, Minneapolis, or in the organizations, or whatever it might be. But anyway, collecting their opinions so that then I can indeed speak on behalf of some of the Indians. And I've been doing enough work at the Policy Center for the last 27 years that I've dealt with these kinds of things among many other uh, political, legal, cultural, um, linguistic, and so forth. So what I say about the, the murals is just a, it's even tinier than the snapshots that we get in here. Um, there is no way that we can historically represent American Indians through any neural or snapshot or stories. That goes way deeper than that. I'm saying I know history not because it's the literature or the media that I learned from. What I've learned about history comes from my traditional history a traditional history meaning an oral history. That means that I know things that my people have handed down throughout the generations for thousands of years. I know how we came to be here. 
on this planet, Mother Earth. I know that came from my elders, from the healers and the medicine people who taught me all these years. So I know that, but I also know that America doesn't know that. And that's the most critical point that I want to make here tonight, is that I'm not here to argue about morals, what they represent or don't represent. I'm here on a wider kind of perspective that more needs to be learned about the American Indians. And you can't get it from the literature and from the history books because it's not there. What we have to do is go to the Indian people because they're the ones who possess the information that's required to fully know about American Indians. When you look at the contemporary society and the kind of racial disparities in health, education, auto home placement, crime and justice, poverty, transportation, housing, you will find American Indians are ranking pretty high in those categories. And the data doesn't change. The data sets consistently bring out that American Indians are among the poorest of the poor. And one person said, and I really like this, we ask the most from those who have the least. And that's kind of the picture of American Indians. So I'm here to sort of just paint you a broad visionary mural that says you have to learn about American Indians before you can talk about them. If you're going to talk about American Indians, then you have to have a little more of an in-depth dialogue, conversation, narrative, whatever that was coming up in your mind. But there has to be some kind of a back and forth. We, I've read about ourselves throughout the years in, in, in the literature, and gosh knows it, 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 uh, it falls very short of telling the story about who we are. So I wouldn't get too caught up in whether Merlin's representing us or not, because I don't think I got a dog in that fight. I do have a dog in a bigger fight, though. Among the condition of American Indians, where half of us, half of our children don't get out of K-12. They don't graduate. Our children, our babies, uh, are 20 times more likely to be placed out of home than a white child. That's just a couple of interferes. And, and this has been a persistent kind of condition for American Indians. So my contribution here tonight is, uh, I hope you resolve something about the murals. If you ask me what my opinion is, to get really down, down about it, and, and uh, wrestle around on the map, I would tell you I, I don't know, but I will know if I go out and ask my community, well, what do you think? What shall we do? And this is a we situation, not an I situation. It's always been that way among Indian people. We've often, we've had circles of, of numerous kinds, ceremonial, getting married, getting buried, going to learn something. Circles are endemic to our way of knowing. So when I would be faced with this kind of a dilemma, which I'm saying I don't know much about, I would certainly ask for help about who the Indian people are who would want something known about this. And I could give you an opinion until that happens. So I would have to go out into my community and sit down with them and say, well, this is a new, this is a new question for us. So we can take some new answers from from our community, not suggest that maybe some kind of some kind of listening circles or talking circles happen in our community, and then come back and say what we have to say about the Thank you. Got it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Roberts. I'm the president of the Ramsey County Historical Society. And I just wanted to say thank you all for coming out here tonight. I want to say thank you to our hosts. The Eastside Freedom Library was my childhood library. 
and I'm glad to see that it's still a place of learning and where the community comes together, so that's exciting for me. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm going to be leading the task force uh, that is going to be doing this work. I was blessed early on in my career to travel overseas to Syria and work with both Kurdish and Muslim dig crews on an archaeological site excavating a Christian monastery. A very interesting intersection of cultures there. I came back from that and lived in northern Minnesota where with the local historical society I staffed for two years an American Indian Advisory Council uh, involving the tribal members from Fond du Lac, Boys Fort, and uh, Grand Portage bands of Lake Superior Ojibwe. So the Anishinaabe culture was something that I was introduced to very early. And I learned a lot from that. And I'm still learning. I also want to acknowledge that we're sitting on Dakota land right now. This was the, where the Dakota lived. Before it was St. Paul, before it was Minnesota, this was Dakota land. And I think there is a perspective out there saying it still is. And I think respect for that is important. So, <clears throat> Mary brought up history and heritage, and John talked about larger issues. The artwork itself, it's challenging in some ways because it's not inclusive. I have yet to see a piece of art anywhere in the world that is fully inclusive. And what we know about the artist, I don't want us to get too hung up on that. It was 1932, it's a white male artist, painting his lived experience while answering to white male bosses who answered to a committee of people from here in St. Paul who, guess what, were all white men. So that perspective from 1931 is incredibly well represented. We can do better than that, though, is this artwork wouldn't be what would be installed today. That wouldn't be what would happen. And so as we move forward, we want to hear from everybody. Four pieces of art being created for this project are not going to end racism or gender inequity in St. Paul. Conversations like the one we're having tonight, hopefully we'll have a lot of those in the coming years, is the way that we can make those changes. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, our process on Monday morning, well, I'm not going to say morning, we've had some people out sick. But uh, on Monday, our website's going to have information on it about how to become part of a steering committee. I'd love to hear from everybody. If you haven't signed in yet in the back, please do so we have your email address and we can reach you. I have cards on me if you want to talk to me afterwards. I want to hear from everyone. We'll get this information out, but we want people to be part of this task force that will then clarify exactly what are we asking the artists to do. We'll help select the artists and make a recommendation to Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul about the installation of the art at the end of the process. Okay. Our goal on this is to celebrate, to go back to the original intent that Mr. Norton was trying to achieve, which was celebrating progress in St. Paul and its people. That stopped being even close to accurate as soon as they were painted. It's been 87 years. It's been a lot of progress. It's been a lot of things done. There's a lot of things that we can celebrate. So let's do that. We're also taking an approach that focuses on local artists and makes it an accessible process, okay? Shortly after Frank died, which was 1934, I think, he, uh, the WPA was starting to do some different things, uh, art projects. One of them was sponsoring murals all over the place in this country. A lot of the murals that you see today that were WPA projects were painted by people with no experience doing murals. The way we're approaching this project allows local artists that are not muralists to participate. So I have a little homage back to that whole effort. But anyways, we're excited about doing this with the Ramsey County Historical Society and working with everybody. We have been involved in this process for quite a while now and figuring out the right way to move ahead that's respectful of the past and respectful of what's been created while also allowing for these conversations to happen by comparing the new art and the old art. Uh, we think it's gonna have the biggest possible positive impact on the community. My name is Setu Jones, and I am a visual artist. I do large-scale public artworks. Uh, and so um, my comments 
are going to be framed by uh, the comments of an artist. But first, I also need to acknowledge the fact that we are on Dakota land. I also need to recognize and thank uh, Peter Ratcliffe, Beth Cleary, and the staff here at the library for opening this space up for this discussion. And also thank the Ramsey County Commissioners. I'm sitting here between two politicians. So, <laughs> so uh, and actually, another political comment that Peter made about me being from Frogtown, I, I, I do cross borders. <laughs> And do that sometimes with ease, sometimes with the wall between us. And, and this discussion will help break down many of those walls. So I need to thank the Ramsey County Commissioners and the St. Paul City Council members for, uh, for broaching this topic. Uh, and this is a big deal on one hand, and on another hand, it's not a big deal. Uh, I I need to say up front that I also, like John had stated, uh, am concerned about these large issues. Uh, the growing and persistent disparities between whites and people of color that exist here in Minnesota and in Ramsey County in particular. Uh, and so, in a way, this discussion <laughs> is very small. Uh, at the same time, when I say it's not a big deal, I am on the side of the folks that think these things need to be removed. Uh, art speaks to a particular point in time. Uh, and art is also very contextual. Uh, it relates to the particular point that we are in society and relates to particular sites. Uh, the works that are there now, actually, let me even back up a little bit. Uh, I am a fourth generation Minnesotan. With the birth of my grandkids, my family has been here uh, for six generations. My great grandfather, who was <coughs> born into slavery in the 1840s, came upriver and settled in Red Wing, Minnesota. He worked as a porter for the St. James Hotel that still stands, uh, where he earned enough money to start a farm in Rochester, where my grandmother was born, and moved to Old Rondo, where my father was born. My great-grandfather uh, fought in the Civil War, uh, followed that highway up north, and was one of those laborers. He was a porter there. Uh, the rail line came right past there. The steamboats <laughs> landed there. And he hauled baggage back and forth uh, from the St. James Hotel to, uh, to the dock that was there. So that's one little aside. Another thing is, and uh, just follow with me for a second. My, and as I'm going to talk about the murals themselves, my father. Uh, and his partner, born in Old Rondo, moved as far away as they could uh, from Old Rondo all the way to Minneapolis, <laughs> and where I was born. And my father and his business partner owned a liquor store in South Minneapolis. I worked in that liquor store. And every Friday, like clockwork, there was this uh, <coughs> Uh, African-American man, one of my father's uh, customers, uh, friends, that would come in every Friday when he got his paycheck. And we'd ask him over and over, ask him, how you doing, man? What's up? What's going on? And his response was always the same, every Friday. And it was, you say, what's going on? His response was, white man still on top. <laughs> and that was uh, a comment on those disparities that exist. But it's also really clearly evident in the murals. <laughs> the murals really help enforce that attitude. Uh, and 
we are not alone in this discussion of this particular artist. Uh, I, under, as uh, working and uh, creating these large scale works that I do, uh, you know, I understand many times the pressures that are put on you by your patrons. And, uh, and so he reflects that. But we are not alone in this discussion with this particular artist. This particular artist created these grand murals in courthouses throughout the country. John Norton's work is, are, in, are in courthouses in California, uh, in the Midwest, and down south. Right now, uh, the Alabama NAACP is uh, requesting and demanding the removal of murals by John, Mor John Norton in the uh, Jefferson County uh, Courthouse. Uh, works done in the same style with this large figure, these uh, really tall pieces, the large figure is a central figure there, and the title of two murals there are called the Old South. And of course, there again, it's a woman, a white woman, and a white man in this, uh, two separate murals on top of uh, black folks picking cotton, uh, performing menial tasks. Uh, and so this is something that, uh, it's something, this is a conversation that we're having specifically about this particular muralist, but also about what is appropriate for a particular point in time throughout the country. I mean, we've, we've heard and seen and talked about these uh, and been sometimes a part of discussions to remove uh, Confederate war memorials or memorials to, uh, to people who were uh, a part of the Confederacy in some way or another. So this is something that is that we are beginning to take control of them. And I'm going to say this and then I'm going to be quiet. The most public artwork created over the last 100 years, 150 years, really tells these narratives of the dominant culture. And uh, it was mentioned the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, during the time of the Depression, the Federal Artist Project that was a part of it, there were artists that really began to tell other stories. Stories of folks who were oppressed. And that was one of the few times in American history that we started to see work that really spoke to more folks than the folks on top. And we have this grand opportunity now to begin to tell this story that reflects uh, more folks. But a word of caution, <laughs> and this is, it, and I have to be careful in saying this, is that as an artist, I've created work that folks sometimes have a problem with. Sometimes it's challenging. Uh, and I'm not sure if I will be here uh, in 20 years defending my work. <laughs> uh, I mean, and that's the, the flip side of this as well, too. Uh, but we've got this grand opportunity and we need to take advantage of it. And I really appreciate the fact that the city and the county have uh, sponsored this committee to begin this dialogue. Thank you. Hamatakiapi, um, Crystal Norcross and Machiapi, um, Shinkumani who want me, uh, the Kote Machiapi, um, Sister Wapden, Oyate Hamataha, um, Mbiza Ska Edwati. Hello, my name is Crystal Norcross, um, I'm from the Sister Wapden Oyate, um, I am a Dakota woman. And thank you for acknowledging being on Dakota land, first of all, first and foremost. Um, I'm 
I'm gonna get straight to the point. Um, those murals gotta go. I don't care who you are and whose history you're telling and who it's historic to. Um, as a Dakota woman sitting in there, I can get, I can just looking at the murals, seeing them every single time I go in there. I won't even bring my children into that room because of the hurt and. You know, it, it stems back to a level of historical trauma, I just want to say. Um, I have a hard time every time thinking of the points I need to make when I'm before city council because of these murals. I don't care if they're historical to anybody because it always tells the Western civilization, uh, the Western world, westward thinking. Um, it's not my history. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, you know, uh, Seeing a, seeing a man kneeling before a cross with a guy holding it, I mean, come on. We can do better than that St. Paul. Look where we are today. I'm a Dakota woman. I'm still here, and I'm going to legal on my own land. Mm -hmm. It's, I know so many Dakota artists. I sit on a, an arts board of a group called Oyate Hotana, which means Voice of the People. I do a lot of work with different artists, and I know for a fact that we can come up with something to tell our own narrative. You know, um, we have artists, uh, professionals nowadays. I mean, we could tell our own stories. So I want to see the mural go down. You know, I don't care. You can display it somewhere else, just not in there, because it also represents city council today as I see it. But I would like to see those go down and I'd like you to maybe hire a Dakota artist, someone who could tell our story for us and on our behalf. You know, and besides Dakota people, also Anishinaabe people did live here. And I'm also would like to acknowledge I am part Anishinaabe from White Earth. Um, so my roots come within this land. I didn't immigrate here. I did not anything. This is my homeland. This is this is my people. This is where my people will continue to stay. You know, on the roots of the Missis uh, Mississippi River here, um, this whole area of Bedote, um, this is our land. And you know, if you really, really, truly just to, if you really, truly. <laughs> Respect the quota people. You know, this is not a hard ask. It really isn't. Thank you. Um, thank you, Crystal, and thanks to all my fellow panelists. I think um, my, my position on the murals is very directly informed by a process that we've been going through in the Moms Park neighborhood to, um, to get ourselves reacquainted with, or get ourselves acquainted as white people with the land that we took from the Dakota. And the process that we've been going through um, to, to restore that history has been something that Crystal has really helped me to understand. And, um, I was at one of those meetings recently with the historic tribal, the tribal historic preservation officers from the um, from around the state, and one of my Dakota constituents, when it was his turn to talk, he dropped to his knees, and he said, "This is the way Jane Prince looks at me when she's sitting in the city council." And um, there's no way to explain that to a room full of my neighbors. It's, it's disgrace. I truly feel it's disgraceful. Um, how the murals got there, um, you know, we know the history, but as early as the 70s when Ruby Hunt was on the council, Ruby said, we need to do something about those murals. And then it has come up periodically since then. And prior to my getting on the council, 
my council colleagues, I know um, Amy Brenlon and Chris Tolbert um, had raised issues about them and felt that it was time for them to go. And in fact, Amy's idea, which I still think is a good one even in the near term, is that we get shades to cover them until we've figured this out. And when the building is operating as a museum, when there are tours being given, the shades could be up. But when the, that living, breathing room of democracy is being used as a public meeting place, those murals need to be covered. When, when we're meeting as the city council, we have hundreds of people testify at the city council in the course of a year. They're extremely diverse. Sometimes in my job, I'm meeting in a quasi-judicial capacity, which means I have the power to impose fines, to grant licenses, to revoke licenses, to, to directly impact people's property rights. If a person of color comes into that room to make their case to me, I'm their boss. I mean, they're my boss. They elect me. But I sit there and make judgments on, on what is going to happen to them while they're looking at those pictures and thinking, that's the way they view me. Those pictures raise the question of whether or not we, as the city of St. Paul, are still viewing our constituents of color as they were viewed in 1932. And that is completely and totally inappropriate. In our form of government, and we all know it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, the city council chamber is one of those civic, sacred places where people go to find justice and truth, to appeal for their rights, to speak their mind, to tell the politicians off, and um, those murals don't belong in there. So my feeling is, in the short term and in the long term, it's time to pull the shades down on those murals. We, they need to be gone. I appreciate there, that there is a process that the city council has approved for this, but I am sensitive, Chad, and, and, and I will recommend, um, I will be finding out people who want to serve on the committee. Um, but I'm very concerned about having people of color be on a committee where they somehow are being asked to make some kind of a compromise about what goes on the wall. I think murals have to come down. And I just want to read one other thing that was sent in terms of a perspective of someone who is an executive at a, at a corporation in St. Paul. And he comes from Spain. And he wrote to us on the council and he said, I mean, this is a business executive and while I don't know him, I think he's white. I was born and raised in Madrid, and until my family moved to Minnesota in the mid-1970s, I lived under Franco's fascist regime. The wall panels in the city chambers bring back memories of the Franco days, where church and state acted as one, and where there was zero tolerance for diverse opinions or beliefs which did not align with Franco's fundamentalist views. So there is a whole different perspective on the visceral reaction that people can have when they walk into the chamber. And I think we have to take that very seriously. Good evening. I'm Jim McDonald, the Ramsey County Commissioner. I chair the Ramsey County Board. And I just want to actually start off, because I don't know if it's ever been actually stated, um, what action the County Board and City Council took here at the end of last year. But both the City Council and the County Board approved resolutions to move forward on a process working through the Ramsey County Historical Society to engage community 
to um, reach out to artists within the community to um, craft four panels. Each panel has a theme, and the thought would be that the new panels would be crafted in connection to each theme. And then two of those panels would be displayed at a time in batching pairs. So you have, you know, an industrial theme, an exploration theme, a transportation theme, um, and they would be side by side. So you'd have the original mural, then you would have a, a new community-based um, mural created by artists and owned by the community to be up there. And the intent is to make sure that we continue to have conversations, right? I don't support the shades. We can't hide our history. Pulling the shades down and trying to deny our past just does not help us grow as individuals. It doesn't provide the opportunities for the conversations we're having here today. The intent is, with these murals paired, is to be able to continue. To, we're not done growing as a community. We're doing better than those 1930 murals reflect. But we still got a long ways to go. And we need to continue to challenge ourselves on how we do that. And we need to provide platforms like Beth and and Peter do here, but we also need to provide that platform where we do our business, right? But I also understand what those murals reflect when people walk into that chambers and they don't see the current vision of our community. They don't see themselves in those murals in the healthy way. And I look at those murals different. I grow, I challenge myself all the time. I'm a 63-year-old white Irish guy that grew up on the east side. This was my childhood library. My kids were the third generation to go to Johnson High School, and I love this community, Jerry and the diversity and the richnesses in this community. But I challenge myself every single day to, to do better and to understand from a perspective, that's my lived experience, right? A white, white privileged lived experience, right? That's my experience. It's not necessarily that I had it any easier. I, I, I got my milk in 50 pound sacks of powder, right? My water came in 25 pound sacks where you or tubs where I had to mix in capsules, you know, to make it look yellow so you could actually it was butter. We were quite poor growing up, but I still had that white privilege. And I challenged myself. And I, one of the things now I look at that, that those murals in there differently just from an event that I was here in this room maybe eight months ago. Um, Peter had a number of youth here um, from various different backgrounds kind of sharing their experiences living as youth in our community. And then some of the generational effects of uh, first generation immigrants and second generation and third generation, them being the ones that were born here, right? And a lot of conversations, and there was a Native American on that panel, and, and she talked about her lived experiences, and, and I, you know, I've heard of generational trauma, historical trauma, but I don't experience that, I really don't. I don't, you know, I can try to understand that, right? But now, um, after that night, when I look at that picture of that Christian standing over those Indians, I look at that totally different. Because that night, that young woman shared with me, people in this room, a story. A story of her grandma struggled to walk and always had trouble with her knees. And she asked her grandma many times over the years, what was wrong, what happened? And her grandma would never, ever talk about it. And finally, on her deathbed, her grandma called her own. And she said, I've never told you the story about what happened to my niece, but I want you to know now. I was in a Christian boarding school, and when you spoke your native language, they would put marbles in socks and make us kneel on the socks for hours at a time. Right? And, and my, my eyes were welling up. I, I felt the effect of historical generation trauma through that story that she told. When I look at that mural, I feel that. I don't want to cover that up for our community. I want us to be able to feel that. I want us to be able to grow from that, and I want us to be able to challenge ourselves to do better. I, I think someone mentioned, I don't know what this community is going to look like in 20 or 30 years, and they may be having the same conversations about the artwork we put up today. It's not going to be relevant, and that's good. But, and I don't know what we do, but denying our history, no matter how ugly it is, does not allow us to grow to our full potential. But to challenge ourselves to have the conversations that I hope will happen in those chambers, in these rooms, I hope Peter and Beth can sponsor and we can host a meeting like this in the chambers after the new murals are up, right? And we're in those chambers and we can talk about what's on those pictures. 
and we can talk about what's reflected in those communities. And just a couple of other quick things I, I want to make sure we talk it over. The, the, the views in the community are so coming from all over. There was a reference to the African Americans in the murals carrying the, um, the sacks as slaves. And I got a lot of feedback and emails from African Americans that were totally offended with that. Because they weren't slaves. They were porters and red caps. And that provided income and wealth for a community for Rondo to grow. And they took pride. But it does reflect that that was as far as they could go in our society for income or wealth was being those laborers, those longshoremen, those red cap. And we've come a long ways from that. Our community needs to reflect that. And we need to be able to have those conversations. So my hope is maybe in this next mural where there's a, a Christian standing over a Native American, it might be a young girl in a tattered dress kneeling on a sock with marbles for us to have those conversations about what was perceived from a white man in a white community that reflected what they see and felt that their community was to the realities of what that community was to actually where we are as a community now and how far we've come. And that, that's, that's how I've been approaching this. That's how I feel about it. And now I'm really interested to hear uh, your reflections and your thoughts, because I think that's what we're going to do next. Well, uh, thanks. Um, we've heard several voices already, but uh, I don't know how far this microphone is going to reach. But if other folks want to uh, join the conversation out loud, now would be the time. So. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. Uh, uh, I'm going to start at this one. Okay. Uh, well, then we'll see. We'll start here. Okay. okay. All right. Well, so my question is, why do you, do you have to have the murals? Why does there have to be murals there? Can there be something else that? Um, for lack of a better word, abstract, that might stand the test of time. Um, also with those murals, if they, it was done in 1931. Um, lots of things that happened in Minnesota in 1931. There's a lynching in Duluth in 1924. Um, also in Minnesota was the Dred Scott case, the Eliza Winston case. And it's all about slavery and would African American people be seen as citizens? And so, no, those murals don't reflect a lot of history. And Mr. McDonough, I think, I agree with uh, Ms. Prince that they should be covered. And uh, your rationalization that we can't hide the history, but I don't see that as hiding, that would just be shutting something out that do people really need to see that when they're coming into uh, the changes that she mentioned? It doesn't do. I don't think it would um, deepen their appreciation for, for Minnesota history. It would possibly cause a lot of anxiety and anger. So, and possibly trauma. <coughs> as you mentioned. But, so, why does it even have to be murals? Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, what you said is amazing. I didn't hear everybody's so open right here. Um, very profound. Um, I think the way to look to the future you know, historical trauma can be, you know, understood by a lot of people that haven't been through it, but it is real and it is passed on from generation to generation. And I get that you try to understand it, but at the same time, looking at things like that doesn't help. Doesn't help at all. You know, I'm like, I kind of understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, it's more, you know, I don't know, like my ancestors, you know, they, it, it was truth and love and honor, and, you know, and there was a way about going, going about things. And 
looking at these things, you know, they, it, it does hurt people. It does remind them, you know, like, um, like the story you heard, you know, my grandparents went through that, you know, and they didn't like to relive it. You know, and looking at the things, people relive it, you know, even if you haven't been there. And it's cool to be able to, you know, get a feel for it, but at the same time, it, pain, pain extends throughout generations. You know, it, it, it's passed on, and, and a lot of times it's not understood. You know, like for me, myself, I'm going to school to be an addiction counselor because I want to help heal people. You know, I want people to, you know, thrive. And to look at these murals and accept them for the way they are is kind of like condoning what, what's been done. You know, and if you don't stand for something, you, you know, what, what's it worth? And if you're not saying anything, are you really, you're not against it. You know, if you're not standing up for something, you'll fall for anything pretty much. And these murals, they say a lot. You know, Christianity didn't exist on in these North and South America before they got here. You know, and it was pushed on us constantly. And if we didn't, you know, if we didn't conform, we died. You know, and that was all, like, we couldn't practice our culture until the 70s. You know, like, can you understand what that means? Like, we couldn't even, you know, pray, we couldn't sing. You know, we couldn't honor our ancestors in public without, you know, death, facing death. And to us, that, that says a lot to be here. Like, she's proud to be here because she survived. I survived. Somewhere down the line of my generation, one of my ancestors made it out. And then that caused the ripple effect to today. Them murals cause a ripple effect. And it's what we want to do with it now. Then to be able to put Dakota there and Hmong there, different cultures there, something that speaks to this community for the future because the children now are the ones that are going to change the future. You know, because we don't borrow this land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. That's all I have to say. Um, so I, I'm just going to contribute a, a few thoughts, uh, kind of unconnected maybe, I don't know. Um, so I have, I come from a history background, and I feel a little conflicted. Um, but I will also say I've been in the council chamber once, and that was in the last year. And the first, I did notice the white men the big ones, you know, in the, in the murals first. But I was focused on what I was there for. And um, it wasn't until after that somebody pointed out the smaller bits below. And I have to say that I kind of cringed, actually. Um, so I, I felt uncomfortable with those images um, there. And the other thing that's a little unconnected to that, but what you um, said about abstract. I, I was in Nebraska this summer, and I had like 20 minutes to go into the, their state capitol building, which is an art deco building, and which has um, uh, more abstract kinds of art in it, instead of the kinds of art that um, I also stopped at the Iowa State Capitol. <laughs> and that was more like our capital, you know. Um, and so it, it was very different to be in a public, you know, a government space like that and have a totally different kind of art. So. Earlier, uh, Ms. Wigger? Yes. Is that you, um, in your introduction, you said that you didn't see anything offensive about the murals, and, and that that's probably true, but maybe they're not offensive, they're just really insensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, and, and, and perhaps that's what people are feeling, not so much that it's offensive, because it's not offensive, but there's something that's just off kilter there. Well, as women, we feel that too with all those big men out yeah. there. I mean, I mean, clearly there is. I mean, I didn't want to suggest that there isn't a problem because there's all kinds of problems with them. But they are so. As a as a teacher, I see them as just you know great opportunities for us to have discussions and to talk about the past and how it is inadequate. But at the same time, I didn't want to suggest that 
people doing, you know, people who really built this city, you know, your grandfather, great grandfather, that that, that shouldn't be celebrated as much as as you know some politician at the Capitol, right? I mean, I'm really proud of my great grandfather, and he, you know, he had a shovel and dug the streets, and I, I think that's great, <laughs> but um, I, I guess. I'm, as a historian, it's really hard for me to accept erasing the past. And I feel like it's, it, it is gonna make things distorted in, in yet another way. If, you know, in a sense, we're creating new heritage, right? This is how we are, we're these wonderful people and we're totally <clears throat> inclusive and we've always been like this. So my, my uh, recommendation would be to, do, to follow more along the lines of what the council is heading. I don't know if I'm exactly with you, but to, that, that these murals needed, need to be added to and c corrected with, and have them there as an example of where we were, as Jim said. I'll take another bite out of the apple here. <laughs> After hearing some of the comments that uh, my uh, Lakota and Snobby people have weighed in on, um, I tried to uh, get this at a higher level to uh, what I told you about were the results of having such uh, murals in public. Um, doesn't necessarily take away from anything, but it has a tendency to reinforce some of the thinking about American Indian people. And the reason I gave you the, the, uh, the data that I mentioned, just a small piece, um, is to say that the damage that those kinds of things do, as this young gentleman uh, contributed, are real. They're, they're, uh, I had an op-ed piece in the paper the last couple of weeks, I guess, and what I talked about was the, um, I think the, uh, the uh, writer, the author of the piece that I was commenting on, he had mentioned that uh, all the good people of uh, Minnesota made, made it what it was after the uh, claiming of statehood with no mention of the native population before that, of what our contrib contributions were. And what I mentioned in the piece that uh, I co-wrote, a, a couple of good friends of mine, and uh, was that Manifest Destiny, I don't know how many of you are aware or knowledgeable about Manifest Destiny, but it follows the same footsteps of uh, what's in the Christian Bible in uh, Genesis 1, 28, to rule over the birds, the animals, the fish, and all that uh, creatures on the earth, that this was man's sort of edict at that time. And, and that's kind of what Manifest Destiny came out to be. Uh, and we're still living with it today. You just look at the environment, uh, you look at the, the birds, the fish, the waters, the air, and uh, we're paying some prices here, but we don't really reflect on how we got here so much. Part of us are in denial, part of us are fighting very strongly. And so that, that's kind of what I was trying to get at in, in my commentary here, is that, yeah, there's, there's a source of this, but I, I think there's a lot of energy being spent on the source of this, and we, we, overlook what it has caused. These are cause factors for a later predicament that all of us suffer in one way or another. And what I was trying to do was paint a bigger picture and looking at the, the, the way that American Indian people live today and the kinds of disparities that we have in our communities are a part of that. My, my mother and father met in a boarding school so they, by gosh, sure knew what 
what this was in, in terms of pain and misery and deprival of uh, their ceremonials and language and so forth. And that came down to me, so they, so they asked that I not speak Indian anymore. They asked that I not do that. Why? They thought that I'd have a better chance of getting along in society. So that's part of what, what we're talking about here. When I talk about that, you don't know the Indian people in the professionals, the academy, the, the institutions of America of all kinds, uh, really don't know who we are. Until it happens, we won't have to come up here and be on a panel or be invited to a group meeting in, in the midst of the Indian country. So I, I just want to move this thing to a higher level than uh, yes or no about uh, morals being in a public place. I would, I would dare say that most Indian people don't even know they're there. Because we don't have any business there unless we go to jail. <laughs> and we, go, we go to another part of the courthouse. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the story. So uh, this is an issue. Yeah, it's going to be talked about. It's going to be negotiated. and. And I, I guess I'm, I'm just after listening to a couple of my different compatriots here that I would support the other view, uh, having heard it, not having heard that earlier, I didn't have that kind of an So uh, I support them. We have uh, another issue over here. If, uh, Ani Jacob Juris and Dijna Kaz. Um, I'm an Anishinaabewan language learner, um, white, uh, from Wisconsin. Um, uh, I, I appreciate. Uh, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I I appreciate us meeting on Dakota land um, and is still Dakota land. It never stopped being Dakota land. I think that is an important distinction that we need to recognize. It never stopped. In, in saying all this, I, I think a, a little background is important. Um, my, my ancestors uh, came to Wisconsin six generations ago. They came loggers within that space. Um, additionally, I, I've gone off and got education, a PhD in history, so I also am a historian. And I, I hear the historic perspective here. Um, not trying to whitewash this history, right? Don't hide it away. And yet, I, I guess we have this conversation that no one's saying, let's forget about this history. No one's saying, let's hide this history. No one's saying, let's stop writing about this and teaching our children about this history. What they're saying is, when we come into a public building, a government building, where we're supposed to be all equal in front of the law, Maybe we should actually recognize each other as equal in front of the law. Rather than having a mural that's remembering heritage, why don't we have an aspirational mural? Why, why are we looking back in, in that way? Why aren't we looking forward to the future? Undoubtedly, there are larger issues that we can be addressing. So let's have our art inspiring us to be looking towards those larger issues. Let's be working towards that future that we want on those walls, right? So I, I guess, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you when you say, oh, it's, it's the history, it's that heritage. But we can shape what we want that to be. And we can recognize that that heritage that's on those walls, it doesn't represent, right? And, and, and maybe, maybe we can take it down. Maybe we can put it in the museum, maybe we can have interpretation with it, maybe we can bring it out and say, Look, in the 30s, we, we thought this way. In the 70s, when we didn't take it down, we were still thinking this way. In 2019, when we still have them up, are we still thinking this way? And from what I've already heard from people coming, it kind of sounds like they think we are. So I suppose that's all I have to say about that right now. <coughs> Hi, my name is Scott Russell. I, um, I volunteer with a group called Healing Minnesota Stories, and we were very involved with the effort to get them to change the art in the Minnesota State Capitol. And it's 
issue really resonates with me. I'm very glad. I appreciate it, that you're, you're addressing it. Um, actually, pretty much everything I wanted to say, which is said by the earlier gentleman, um, I want to talk just a little bit about the comment about, you know, really, and I appreciate, John, your comments about, you know, there are so many bigger issues out there that disparities in education and health care and out of home placements. But to me, it, it, this is, it is symbolic, and it's like we won't be able to change the house if we can't change, even change the wallpaper. And this is about taking a small step and really helping this conversation come forward. And I really appreciate how Peter framed this as being, you know, changing the girls is not going to change a lot, but having this conversation could. So um, I agree that I, I think, and this is the same, exact same conversation we had at the state capitol, it's like, we're not saying destroy the art movement. If, if what's really important here is to have a conversation about what this art means. You're not going to have that in the city council chamber. That's not a place where people can come in and have a conversation. That place is like Ramsey County or some historical society where there is a quiet space and you can develop a curriculum and preserve the art and talk about all the pluses and negatives that are represented in that art. Um, and, I actually, and I also would just echo the idea that um, yeah, that so much of the art in public buildings is is historical and what how different it would look if we had art it's like what are we moving towards what is the vision for our future so that's really what we're focused on instead of really focusing on on the, the pain really like what is what is our image for the future and how everybody can come together um, there's a state capital in uh, in new mexico and they've got a capital art foundation and the whole capital is decorated with contemporary native new mexican or new mexican artists and it's just, uh, I, mean, just I, I haven't visited I've seen it online, but it's just a whole different feel. So thanks. I want to uh, apologize to my elder here when I speak. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but I kind of got, and one of the triggers for me was I, what I thought I just heard was something that would be said about taking down a Confederate uh, statue just a few minutes ago, and it really upset me. I, I think it's easy, and it, and it, but it's also difficult for people that don't walk in, walk in our shoes to um, appreciate that. I think I like art, I like history, um, but I took pictures, I, was at, I, I took pictures of when I was at that building and, and sent them out and I had like 4,000 Facebook friends and, and people across the country were, were appalled. And uh, I uh, teach in the east side here, uh, and I have native students in my classroom. I'm native, and you know I've gone to many um, protests, uh, Redskins uh, football protests, and I've seen um, 14 and 15 year old students spit on because they're speaking their truth. And I just uh, hope that some of you that have good hearts will listen to what you're saying and try and put uh, perspective to it. Because it's really hard unless you walk in the shoes of, uh, of some of our people here. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, or when you do with Shemina Manupa, many so the woman is paying on your head, but the Dakota woman, or Dakota we know, which one day was staying up here to the Hello, my relatives. My name is Michelle Bowman. I uh, welcome you with a good heart. I am 20 years old and I go to school at the U. Um, I am a Dakota woman from Sisseton. Uh, I currently live in Southside Minneapolis, born and raised. Um, and I just kind of wanted to talk um, from a youth's perspective and a, a Dakota youth's perspective and saying that um, I've seen the murals once. And when I went in there, I cried. Because um, you're just addressing historical and intergenerational trauma. And I hear what everyone's saying and I'm listening with respectful ears but I'm still kind of questioning and wondering why it is we are so concerned about honoring one white man's depiction of history and not the people that are in this room today and in our community right now. Um, why is it that we are talking about progression but more concerned with honoring 
a white man from a very long time ago than the people in our community today? And I think that's a question um, we should all consider. And I think it's also important to note that uh, indigenous youth have the highest suicide rates amongst any other demographics. And it has been proven time again through different articles, statistics, and other publications that one of the root causes to these high suicide rates is um, self-identity issues. And that comes from lack of proper representation. So when indigenous youth, especially those um, invested in politics or wanting to take that political path, if they are to visit our capital and see that type of representation, it's gonna reflect ne um, negatively on how they view themselves. And that is the biggest pressing issue for our Native youth today. And if we want to be progressive and if we want to be accepting, we need to keep the lives of our youth in our, our minds and in the things that we do and the way that we go about things. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. And I'm happy to I guess I have to speak as a Dakota elder. <laughs> but, um, to me, we're talking about the perpetuation of racism, of the imperial expansion and the misconceptions of America. And what's happening in these days is the correction. We don't need to distinguish between hiding or heritage or history or uh, covering that up or uh, <clears throat> using some kind of uh, other analogy. The people that were down there underneath this priest had marbles underneath their knees. They might be smiling on the painting, but there was the knees there. This is just, we're talking about changing the narrative. We have to deal with racism face up. When I was in Japan, the indigenous people there are called Ainu. And they refer to the Japanese as bad neighbors. And I asked them about that. And they explained why. The treatment and the abuse. And the same happened here. And I think we have to begin to face this up in America, United States of America, 2019, and realize that there were severe mistakes in the past. All the way from Columbus, all the way up here to the Freedom Library right now. And hiding it or trying to correct it and all that is, is all evasive and throwing it underneath the rug. We have to begin to deal with things face to face as, as, as neighbors and began to realize that this place that we live in belongs to us all. And if you can continue to perpetuate the image that, that Indians and blacks are down below white people and perpetuate that type of mentality, whether it's displayed in art or in the marginalization in society that we see, we're going to continue to have that. This is an example for America, and especially here in St. Paul, to stand up and do something that the rest of the world can see. Because we're supposed to be progressive. We're supposed to be liberal. We're supposed to be good-hearted people. We're supposed to be uh, neighbors. Neighbors. So let's begin to live as neighbors. And that's a bad thing to be putting up there. And I don't know what the correction of it is to, to get rid of them, to cover them up, to put something else there. I don't, I don't care. I just don't like having to see that perpetuation of this stereotype and misconceptions that is demeaning to us. You have marginalized us to invisibility. The last 50 years, we've been talking to everybody and they still don't hear us. This is an example that the city of St. Paul can say, okay, it's a new order. We don't have to listen to the lies 
perpetuated by the fool in Washington, we can do something about it right here now. And taking that down, taking them down, get rid of them. Stop it. I believe many African Americans and Natives would appreciate that from the white people. And I think you would have something good to put in your heart and in your mind and pass on and say, okay, I'm not just a person of goodwill and good thoughts, but of good action. And that's a one step, one example. You know, you see Columbus sitting in front of the leg legislature inside the Capitol. Do you ever notice the Indians sitting there with the peace pipe? That great big statue. You know, we're chastised so much for praying in our traditional way. I see this humongous statue of an of a Indian with a pipe. Now something like that, then it, that's what we need to display. I think it's supposed to be something like, something about peace. And maybe, maybe I'm, I'm going off here, you know, but it's just time enough. Time enough. And this is an example that you can take, an opportunity. Just face up to it. Forget all this stuff about color and privilege and gender and all this stuff. This is one little act that you can do we can do here as citizens in St. Paul, demand St. Paul do that. We have finally have an African -Amer American mayor. So let's let's change this stuff for the next 500 years. So if somebody comes in there in 3035 if they're still here and they won't see some stupid ass thing like that. Uh, I guess I shouldn't cut. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, my elder here said what I, I, I'm trying so hard not to, to get mad over it. it. This topic is very triggering because of the fact that you know, stuff, the stuff that you were talking about, the kneeling on marbles. My grandma was locked in a closet for three days. My grandma has emotional, like, um, PTSD. And so, um, my grandma's not that old. <laughs> and that was two generations ago, three generations ago is where my, my great grandma and great grandpa experienced uh, what was on those paintings. So I'm not, but, but because of all those experience, I'm here today. I'm here today and it's not that I wanna cover them up. I don't, you know, I don't wanna discount history because I would not be here today without, you know, the backstories that everybody has. But it's like a microaggression. <laughs> You see it every time, you just get angry. And it, it just festers. And every time it just makes me more angry walking into that place. Thus me not allowing my children to go into that place. And here I am, being one of the first Native American people to be interviewed for the city council uh, spot. And it, it took a lot of thinking. And that painting, made me not want to do it. It made me not want to do that. But I feel like I owe my people, I owe my neighbors, my relatives, all my neighbors are my relatives. We have this, this saying in, in our culture, and it means we are all related. So all of you guys are my relatives. But I feel like that, in mind, I see myself as being aunties to all your children. And, you know, I just want a better role for everybody, but 
little tiny microaggressions like that is only going to get people more angry. And 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 I've seen it with myself, and and you know I can I can tell when I get angry. It's in, you know and 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 it just I'm trying to say this without getting angry. I need my sage. <laughs> um, it, it's not that we want to erase the history. I, I, I just I have to keep re repeating that because it's not erasing history. We need to just come together as a community and just, you know, be equals. Is what I'm saying. We don't need murals. I don't I don't care for murals. That that building honestly doesn't mean a whole lot to me. <laughs> you know, as long as I can go in there and talk about. I don't know, what was the last thing I was there talking about? Minimum wage. Minimum wage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to be there and I want to talk on behalf of our neighbors and, and make a world better for all of our children. And and those those don't help our cause. All in all, that's what it is. And and it, it it's a little issue. I understand it's a little issue. But knocking these little issues out makes our world better. Maybe a couple more. Um, did, did you want to say something? Hey everyone, my name is Nelsie Yang. I'm a neighbor here in the East Side, so welcome to all of you to the East Side. Uh, I'm also running for city council here in Ward 6 as well. And so I want to say that like this conversation, I feel me personally, like I have a stake in it. I feel like all of us here, we all have a stake in it as well. Because I feel like the place where the murals are located, it's it's a place like representative of home for all for a representative of home for all of us. And when I think about the place where I live that I call home, I think of many, many words like safety. I think about a place that is non-discriminatory. I think about a place that gives me hope, gives me faith, and also a place that a place that is always growing and moving forward and you know, maybe growing in like in family or you know, uh, furniture, all that always moving forward and I feel like you know with this uh, conversation about the murals uh, I feel like that is exactly like what I would want to picture like walking into the building and walking into the room feeling as well and uh, I know like me personally you know like I'm, I'm here because I also res uh, resonate and empathize with a lot of the historical pain and trauma of of what many of our Native American neighbors here are feeling as well when they see it because I know for me, if I was able, if I saw a mural of like uh, a, a mole person, you know, smiling, doing well off, and then on the other, uh, right beside it, it was a, a picture of like the Pathet Lao communists shooting and you know raping a woman in, in villages where my parents came from. That would not be empowering. That would not be a place where I felt it was safe. A place where I felt it was my home. And so there's a, I feel like there's a lot. You know, there's a lot that that needs to to be refreshed and. I feel like this is a moment in probably a long, long time, like probably, I don't even know when this moment will come again for us to be able to, to recreate and redream uh, what home and safety and our democracy is supposed to be about. And like, we gotta really take, uh, take advantage of this moment. And so I have a lot of questions about like the process. Like hopefully you are able to share with us a bit more. I am wondering how it's going to, like who's gonna be picking and selecting the artists? How is it going to be an inclusive process? How do we make sure that um, that whatever, like what is that, what are the questions that you're asking from the community so that they can provide input on what they actually want to see? Like I really loved um, what one of our neighbors here suggested about, hey, you know, well, why does it have to be another painting? Like, well, because I feel like the, the more questions we ask the people in the neighborhood, the more that we will actually get a lot of like diverse opinions about what you know faith, hope, peace actually looks like to actually looks like to them. And so that that process of community community input and engagement is so so important. And as an organizer, uh, I, I think that there is a, a gap in like how sometimes like our government kind of collects this input as well. Because I certainly know that tabling does not is not always the best way to collect the input. And so 
I would love to hear what you're doing to, to uh, uh, gather um, information in a very robust, like grassroots way as well, because a lot of the times input that is collected is collected from people who are already very engaged, already very active. So how do you also include people who uh, have been silenced and, and also maybe might never step foot into the building, but also capture what they are hoping this place would look like and feel like for them? So thank you very much. <coughs> Okay. Um, one more, and uh, okay. I just want to add, um, and maybe not articulately compared to everything that's been said, it's really been a, a healthy conversation. Um, but I feel like we need to be really careful when we say that we're preserving a reality that existed in 1931 and that we have a, um, a duty or an honor. That wasn't a reality. It was an agenda in 1931 to advance the um, beliefs that white people were superior. And if we choose to protect that, we're still advancing that agenda. It, it wasn't, if you asked people what the American story was, in 1931, a lot of people wouldn't have painted that picture. But that picture was painted for a reason. And it served a reason. And we have to ask ourselves, what was that reason? And do we still want to be part of that history? Do we still want to be part of that agenda? Or are we, as people have asked, just willing to be somebody different now? But you're exactly right. You're exactly right about that. And. Uh, <clears throat> You're right, it wasn't an agenda. That, that's, that was the point I was trying to make, and I, I don't think I made it very clearly, is that it's not that we're um, confirming that that was right, but how, do you, how would you know that was the agenda in 1931 if you destroy the evidence? Now, I can, I mean, I, I, I found these, this discussion really persuasive about why maybe those murals don't belong in that room. And I, I'm pretty much persuaded of that. But that, those murals are historical evidence, not of what the reality was of the building of Minnesota, but what the reality was in 1931 about race and class and power. And that's where I see it's still, there's, that they're important historical documents. I guess that's what that's really where I was trying to so go. With that. So we can still study that. But I don't think we need to study those images. They still are alive today. We still are living these stories. We're still perpetuating. The fact that we're even having this conversation and we're not just responding to the native community and the African American community who wants it, who wants them gone, that the story is still alive. We don't need those paintings to study the story. But if we take them down, then we're starting to be a new story, and I think that's more important than. I was thinking about the oral history of my people, and uh, a long time ago, that one of my elders told me, and I don't mean this to be a misunderstanding, but it has its place. And he said. Historians are the most powerful people on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Think about it. So, I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to just wrap this up um, and thank everyone um, who spoke and everyone who listened. Um, I'm going to take home your concept about thinking of each other as neighbors. Um, I think we all learn something and gain something uh, from it. I especially want to thank the panelists for speaking. Um, yeah, let's show them some love. Um, and um, though we're stopping the conversation at this moment, please do touch base with Chad so that you can find answers to some of the questions that Nelsie was asking about the process itself. And Chad had said to me before we started that he hopes that this is not the last 
conversation here, um, and I hope we'll find ways to frame and 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 move forward. And and I just want to say personally, I love Jake's idea about you know what if we had conversations about what future do we imagine, and how could we embody that future, and whether that becomes the images or not, the conversation would be really valuable about what kind of future do we really want as neighbors, as relatives, together. So thank you for coming, and stay tuned uh, for more conversations on this and other topics. Thank you. Thank you.